All right, so uh, moving on with e e economics. Uh, Deirdre uh, actually taught for 12 years in economics at the University of Chicago. She has done, she's expanded now and does um, history, philosophy, rhetoric, ethics. Um, Greg was mentioning a shift to bourgeois society. The, her, Deirdre's last book is the, uh, um, the Bourgeois Virtues, Ethics for an Age of Capitalism. And she describes herself as a postmodern free market quantitative Episcopalian feminist Aristotelian. <laughs> That's me. I have a, as I, as I mentioned before, I have a speech defect. And you can either grow accustomed to it, evolve, um, or you can run screaming from the room. It's your choice. Um, Greg and I are, are old friends, and we're, we began in the, in the same uh, field. We're, we're, both, um, um, we're both economic historians. We're both economist economic historians. Um, you could you could say that here we are the two, two economists in the room. If you, if you place two economists in the room end to end, they wouldn't reach a conclusion. Is is the old joke, and and we don't we agree entirely on the problem. That is, there's a mouth a mouth mouth Uzian equilibrium until. 1800, there's no question about that. And then there's this astounding um, uh, change. But we, do, what, what he and I do not agree on is this um, evolutionary argument that he, he has. And if you want to come to Chicago, and when is it, three, three weeks, Greg, to the Social Science History Convention at the Palmer House, um, we'll have a further discussion of these matters. Um, I, I'm a, um, a I'm, I, as May West said, uh, you know, as I s said, I've, I've kind of wandered off from economics. I started as an economist. But as May West said, I was Snow White and I drifted. <laughs> so, I can't quite get May's, you know. I, um, uh, I was I was once a, a Marxist. I was once a I was once a I was once a materialist. I was once an atheist. I was once, you know, all the things that half the people here are, None except for the Marxist part. I hope. Um, <laughs> And, but I've, I've slowly grown to think more or less the opposite of all the things I thought before. And you can either call that um, uh, some sort of mental disease, or, or, uh, or uh, I've seen the error of my, 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 my ways. But I've always been, since I was young, after the mar Marxism, an advocate for capitalism. I'm a, I'm a free market capitalism. Capitalist Milton Friedman was a personal fr um, uh, uh, um, friend of mine. And I've finally, I've finally come to the, the pr project that I think justifies me in God's eyes, <laughs> which is an apology for capitalism. An apology in the the illogical sense of arguments for capitalism directed at the infidels, all right, at those who don't um, believe. The first volume of what are what I I, I, I claim are going to be four volumes, a, a um, an um, important philosopher of religion named Plotinka um, says in, 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 the, in the last of three volumes on justified Christian belief, he says, I crammed this into three volumes because 
a trilogy might be thought self-indulgent, but a tetralogy is unforgivable. <laughs> Even, I'm sure, in God's eyes. So I'm, I'm doing a t tetralogy. This is volume one. Cheap on Amazon.com. A wonderful uh, 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 book. The Bourgeois Virtues. It's now in paperback. And the question the book asks is, can you be a virtuous person and, particip and participate in a capitalist society? We economists tend to answer that question by saying, huh? <laughs> what does virtue have to do with it? What's good about capitalism, we economists tend to say, is as Greg points out, it makes you 15 times more wealthy than you were before, and that's a good thing. I live with my dog in Chicago, downtown Chicago, in a loft that has 3,100 square feet. You know, this me and my dog. Um, <laughs> and that's, that, that's a, uh, that, according to the economist way of lo looking at it, and Greg and I agree that the economist way of looking at it is kind of, kind of foolish, that's, um, a, that's a tremendous improvement and the only argument you need to make for capitalism. But my Marxist friends and some of my cons conservative friends say, wait, time out. Rich though you are, to express it in Christian terms, you have lost your immortal soul, right? Alienation, anomie, um, uh, psychiatric problems. You're 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 going to go to hell. Actually, there's a there's a wonderful cartoon, a a Far Side cartoon, I think it is, which has a um, long line going down into hell. And there's, there's Satan with his tridents or whatever, and the fire, and this long line is going into hell. And over hell it says, eternal economic seminar. <laughs> and one, guy, one guy says to the other, oh, jeez, I didn't think it would be this bad. <laughs> so there, there's a, um, <laughs> so there, so, the, my, my argument in this book is that there's more to a modern market society than just more, all right? That there are ethical entailments of a market society, as the, as the philosophers might say. That not, not only as, as economists are gradually coming to understand, they've been dragged kicking and screaming to this, screaming this conclusion, but they've gradually, even game theorists, have come to the conclusion that you can't run a capitalist society without inputs of ethics. There has to be some sense of justice and temperance and hope and faith and courage and love if all you have is prudence, if all you have is Max U, this character that's been so important in economics in the last half centuries, first name is Max, his last is U, he's a Vietnamese Jew, I guess, I don't know. <laughs> I've, I, I've always said he would be more, a much more satisfactory person if he was to have a gender change and become Maxine U. Make, would make a lot more sense. But he's, He's a prudence-only person. The only virtue he has is prudence. That is know-how, rationality, savoir-faire. He knows how to accomplish things. He knows how to achieve his ends. What his ends are, he doesn't care. But he knows how to achieve his ends. Prudence only. The only virtue in such a person is prudence. So economists agree that that that, that Max U doesn't work. The Hobbes problem, as I call it. Will a group of unsocialized SOBs form spontaneously a, 
civil society? That's, that's what Hobbes asked, and the answer is, no, dear, they won't. <laughs> that, that they have to be, um, they have, there, has to, there has to be a, a love, there has to be um, a hope, and, and so forth. So the fir first book is a philosophical book. It's a, even a theological book, since I'm anxious to speak to my f fellow progressive Episcopalians as well. Um, and most of my fellow progressive Episcopalians think that capitalism is just awful and that the market corrupts people. And that's the other side of my argument that I make here and then I'm going to continue to make it in the other three volumes, which is that I don't think it's factually true. I don't think it's a scientific truth that participating in a market society makes you a worse person ethically. It can, I mean, obviously, it can be cor cor corrupting, but there's no God versus a, 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 a mammon hopeless ethical uh, problem, such as an awful lot of people in our culture be, um, believe. All right. Um, the framework of that book, and I'm supposed to put my hand up and mysteriously there will appear the, ah, there it is. My, my, my argument in the book is that as as, uh, as Jonathan said, to do enlightenment right, we have to get morality right. And I say that capitalism draws on and encourages seven primary virtues. These are the seven, I forgot my uh, 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 pointer, it's in my purse. Can you hand me my purse? Well, I, I, I know how to operate this one. Um, there are, uh, uh, I, I, I claim, um, and this isn't a casual claim, this is an examined, argued claim, argued for, for, for 500 pages, so it's at least if pagination is how you decide scientific <laughs> questions, then this works. The, the claim is that these, Se these seven virtues, which are, are the Western jury-rigged combination of the four uh, uh, pagan um, um, uh, cl uh, um, cardinal virtues, most suitable to a polis or an armed camp, these, combined with what uh, were called in St. Saint, Saint Thomas Aquinas' um, tra tra tradition, the theological virtues, three, hope, faith, and love, these, these make up an adequate philosophical psychology. I can't persuade you of that in the next... Uh, three minutes, but I urge you to read and especially buy the book, uh, um, and you'll see the, the the case made there for what what seems like a very antique and creaky um, the structure is actually being a fairly good portrayal of how pe I've done some. Comp some comparison with cl uh, classical ch uh, um, uh, um, Chinese thought, and you can see p parallels and, and contrasts as well. But my claim is that these, that these seven virtues, which are, which, are, which are discussed in the West in terms of either heroic, aristocratic virtues, the first of which is courage, or um, the Christian virtues, faith, hope, and love, these three abide, but the greatest is love, can also be used and came to be used in a middle class society, a society that was composed neither 
of aristocratic saints or of of um, of, 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 of of peasant uh, um, saints. Uh, so that's the fir first book. The uh, the the second is how we became bourgeois. And there, Greg and I are on the same path, trying to explain how, um, how there came to be such a very sharp change in a place like England, in which in 1600, in Shakespeare's time, the elite opinion about what was an honorable way to be was entirely aristocratic. The only admirable middle class character in Shakespeare is Anto Anto Antonio in The Merchant of Venice, and he's a fool. Um, all the heroes in Shakespeare are aristocrats. All the jokes are about common uh, people. How that changed between 1600 and uh, my symbolic date is 1776, the date of the publication of Smith's The Wealth of, of Nations is the purpose of this second book. So, so the second book is much more, his, much more historical. Like a, a peg, I think that the crucial time is the end of the 17th century in England. I think that Holland was already a bourgeois society and it, admired these virtues in their commercial uh, um, versions. And there I would, uh, I would claim I'm, I'm still working on this book and still um, I'm on a steep portion of, 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 of my learning curve. You may examine a draft of the book at my website. Um, uh, but I think there's this extremely sharp change at the end of the 17th um, century. Unlike uh, Greg, I don't, I don't believe in, mat in materialist explanations of this uh, change. I don't believe, he doesn't make this argument, but some people do. I, I don't believe that the rise of bourgeois values was simply a consequence of larger numbers of middle class uh, people, for example. I do not believe it was a consequence of foreign trade. I don't believe it was a consequence of exp expropriation of the working class. I don't believe it was a consequence of class struggle. I don't believe it was the profits from the slave trade. I believe, in fact, that there was an ideological change. The causes of the ideological change, as Greg points out in his book, one was always asked what the causes of an ideological change are, are not as clear to me as they ought to be, but someday I'll understand it. I think that these, these two societies, Holland and England and Geneva, actually, as an, uh, another example, had experienced middle-class Republican government. In England's case, it was temporary, but in the other two cases, it was uh, permanent. So they were, they were open to the, this, this possibility of change at the end of the 17th century. I'm persuaded by what by what Le Peg said, that there's a fear of France problem <laughs> that both the English and the, uh, and, and, and the Dutch have at the 17th century. At the end of the 
17th century that ma makes them, I think, particularly interested in pushing forward this bourgeois model of a society against the French. Against the French who had scorned the Huguenots, um, who had thrown them out, they being the l a large part of the, of the active um, um, bourgeoisie of, um, of France. Now observe, this is important for our, our conference. This change that I claim made the modern world um, happened in a religious society. It happened to Christians. It is not the case that the 17th century scientific revolution creates a bunch of subscribers to skeptic. <laughs> and these then invent the modern world. That's not what happened. As, as practically everyone here knows, Isaac N Newton was a persuaded um, Christian. And, and, and figures like Voltaire, as important as they are, are the, ex, the, ex, the, ex, the exception. Most of the entrepreneurs and inventors and scientists of the 17th and 18th century were not um, stupid Christians, a a character which seems to pop, populate the minds of a lot of people at this conference. Not just ignorant and superstitious and half-wits. They were convinced and sophisticated um, Christians. So, uh, and, um, uh, and I, so what's most peculiar about this tra tra transformation, and again, Greg and I entirely agree what the problem is, is that innovation, invention, suddenly takes hold. Uh, look around you. Um, electric lights, uh, carpets, cheap carpets made by machine, clothing, uh, cotton cloth, which in the 18th century was, was an ex was exceptionally expensive, imported from, from India and so forth, became extremely cheap by the middle of the 19th century, and now it sells for, for pr 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 practically nothing at all. This is what makes the modern world. Invention makes the modern world. And the puzzle is, the historical uh, puzzle, that all the, all the historians here are fascinated by is, why did it happen in the 17th, 18th, 19th centuries? And why in Northwestern Europe? And it's, it's a deep uh, uh, puzzle. If modern economic growth were a mechanical result of accumulation, uh, then we'd be in trouble because, be, because the pharaohs could accumulate. They had control over the income of Egypt, at least according to our, at least according to Hollywood's version of the pharaohs, which is all I know about Egypt. <laughs> they, they, could, they could seize the entire income of Egypt. So if they wanted, if they had uh, low time, uh, low time preferences, they could, they could invest, and, uh, and in some degree, they, they, they did but they didn't make the modern world. So there's something peculiar about the modern world. And what I'm claiming in the book um, is that it's about an ethical change. It's about a, um, and, m m and, m and m m m most particularly, it's a change in the way people talked. Because the transformation is between a society that hates trade and disdains trade and tolerates it just uh, 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 b 
barely and regulates it and thinks it's not honorable to a society which does all the other things, which ad, ad, admires trade, um, uh, allows it, uh, uh, does not uh, 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 um, tax it to death, um, and in which being a commercial person, being an inventive commercial person, is suddenly, rather suddenly, an honorable occupation. Whereas the only honorable uh, occup occupation in 1600 was to be a thief, essentially. In Henry the V, Hal goes with goes around with a, 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 a Falstaff, and sometimes by himself, and robs people. Sometimes robbing Falstaff himself. Um, the, the, there's there's no honor in in the mutually advantageous exchange, and that changes. So here's the point: the rhetoric of the economy changes in the late 16th and 18th centuries. And by Adam Smith, there's a worked out ideology, if you want to say, of in, in favor of a, of, a, of a commercial society. I should, I, should, um, I, I should stop here. I'll make one final claim, which is, I think it's true, but I, I'm not. I, I, I'm not sure, and it's very too tentative. It's this: you can't explain innovation with routines. That's where I start. Routines. If if we could routinely invent the steam engine, if it were just I don't know a matter of simple common sense or accumulation or something, it would have happened <laughs> in China or in Egypt or in ancient Rome. So there's, there's a sort of uncertainty pr principle here. What changed was mainly innovation to, to social and social and technological innovation. And that can't be routine or predictable. So you're, so you're left, I claim, with the unpredictability of language. That it's the speech community that uh, um, changes. It becomes possible to have conferences like uh, um, this, where one can, one can argue for unpopular opinions and not find yourself in jail. Although, I don't know, maybe the <laughs> <laughs> it hasn't been proven yet. We'll see. Um, so I, I, so in a, I'm arguing, you'll see, that there's, that there's a freedom of these societies in Northwestern Europe in the in the, in the late 17th and 18th century that makes for a speech community that can entertain all kinds of possibilities. There's a very nice short book by the f famous American historian, one of my father's uh, uh, poker pals, Bud, Bud, Bud Balin where he's, he's, he's arguing for the peculiar inventiveness of the American Constitution. That it's, it's, it's like the electric light or, or the steam engine or something. It's very peculiar. I don't mean it's perfect. It's very far from that. But it's unusually innovative. And I claim that that atmosphere that made among other innovations, the American Constitution also made the, the the world that we see before us. Thank you. So thank you very much. We could, we could do a couple of questions before we go to Stuart Kaufman. Um, uh, Peg, you've got a hand up there. I want to try to 
ask questions that will bring these two presentations together. And begin by saying that while no one who does Dutch history, as far as I know, has had the intelligence or wit to do what Greg has done with those British wills, I would wager to tell you that, I'm, this is a hypothesis, that if you did do a similar um, prosopography of over 3,000 wills, et cetera, that you would find a similar pattern in the, the poorest of the poor dying off. Yeah, or, 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 or going off to Indonesia. Right, exactly, or leaving p precisely. However, uh, as is famously known, the Dutch do not industrialize. And, and this, is, this is the big question. The, the turn toward power technology is the, and that happens in England in the generation born of men born from 1760 onward, roughly. And you can actually, in that first generation, bring that down to about 1,000 people who are actively engaged in that process. Now, one would presume that the people who are capable of that kind of innovation, if Greg's model is correct, would be the fittest of the fit. But in fact, they are not, none of them are landed ar aristocrats. And very few of them are even landed gentry. They come decidedly from the middle, even lower middle class. In religious terms, they range from in the enlightened deism of James Watt to the Unitarianism that you find among the cotton manufacturers of Manchester. But I grant you they're Christians in some kind of sociological and yeah. cultural sense. Why don't these people make their appearance in the Dutch case 100 years earlier? Why is it that when they do make their appearance, they are not the fittest of the fit, but instead come from much lower down the, the gene pool, if you can imagine such a thing? Well, I, I think I think Greg has an answer. <laughs> um, I, I think uh, right. Um, I, I think an important thing to stress here is the uh, the peculiar circumstances that make the English seem much further ahead than other people in this time, and that, that the, really the Industrial Revolution is broader. Uh, even within Britain, it's only occurring within a certain area of the country. And so I'm not pretending in this book to explain the accident, in some sense, of, of the Industrial Revolution. What I want to say is it was becoming more likely. These were becoming societies where you were more likely to have that conjunction. That that conjunction was not possible, it seems, in medieval Europe or in these earlier societies. And so that's one thing is that, you know, the, the, the actual accident of the Industrial Revolution is still hard to explain. But the second thing I'm saying is that the people who made the Industrial Revolution <laughs> were the, the, they were the product of these upper classes from earlier generations, right? That, that they, if you trace back far enough, uh, they were coming from commercially successful circles. Trickle the trickle down, right. That, that what was impressive about Britain in this period is the, the depth of talent in terms of people who are able to kind of look at commercial success, look at possibilities, and that that, that in some sense, that's where I think Deirdre and I are agreeing, that it had become a kind of a deeply bourgeois society, right? And, and so that, but I absolutely accept your point that the, you know, the Dutch are a problem, right? Uh, and uh, uh, the Dutch did have their period in the 17th century, and I absolutely think that this was, a, this was a, going to be a common pattern across Europe it's not going to explain which horse won the race, but it is going to explain why the horses are actually running faster in general in Europe in this period. Right, but what, what would explain wh why this particular horse won the race would be to add to this story that scientific culture in Britain was both deeper and broader than yes. it was in the Dutch Republic. And I think that's true. You, as y you've shown in, in your own work, it's true. Yes. Yes, and it, and it, it I I I I would uh, appropriate th that for my claim that there's an improvement in the in the speech community that is particularly strong in in England, but 
I, I don't worry about Holland too much because after all, southeastern England didn't industrialize either. Well, it did, I, you, you, mu you must realize that all the steam engines that are being procured in the first half of the century yeah, yeah. are coming out of London. Yeah, but the they're being used. From London. But they're yeah. being used in the no it, northwest. They're being used in Cornish mines. Right, but the engineering talent is spread quite throughout the generally. Urban. Yeah, yes. and that, that I'm quite sympathetic. Look, it's it's perfectly possible for. Greg and I to be both correct. He could be making a case. I don't think it works quantitatively, actually, as I'm going to explain in three weeks. But, but it could be perfectly correct that there's a preparation for a middle class society in Northwestern Europe of, of a, a a, a peculiar sort. It's a little odd it didn't happen at, at other times and places. That's one of the scientific problems with it. It is, as s someone pointed out, it's, it's quite odd that pe people can move from one society to another. Um, uh, Greg, in, in case you don't know, is a Scot, um, and his l Scottish ancestors weren't um, um, were constantly being invaded by the English and weren't on this nice, smooth, upward English path. So I, I, yet, when they came uh, south, they, they, they prospered. And then mine could be the, ma the match, so to speak, or this intellectual change that I think I share. The, 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 the conviction that there was an intellectual change is something I share with lots of other historians lots of other historians. And we then would say the, the, the match that caused the e explosion was this intellectual change, possibly. And that, much, as it, much as it pains me, we'll have to leave the subject of England and the Industrial Revolution. <laughs> Thank you, David. <laughs> uh, Thank you.